but more of the issues for the day. Just stay with us. Well, so many things to talk about as, as far as the recession in Nigeria is concerned. This is not the first time we're in a recession, but we're in one now, twice within the past four or five years or thereabout. And what does this spell for us? Where do we go from here? How do we ensure that this doesn't happen again anytime soon? We have three gentlemen joining us for this conversation this morning. Uh, uh, Emmanuel Apollo, uh, economic researcher, risk management professional, and DG, the Economic Think Tank Center Limited, is here with us. Thank you so much. Thank for you your very time. much. It's my pleasure. Yeah, we have the former chairman of uh, Nigeria Economic Summit Group, uh, Buka Kiari, who joins us via uh, Zoom. Thank you so much for your time. As well as the DG Budget Office for the Federation. Ben Akabuze. Thank you so much for your time this morning. Well, let me begin with you, uh, Mr. Abolo. So this is where we are now. Um, one of the things that the people on the panel of the events that we played just before now, the Six Economic Summit Group, just said is that we need to listen to the people. From where you stand, um, from feelers that you may have gotten, what do you think the people are saying. How do you think people are taking this recession on board? Well, we can uh, categorize the group, uh, the, the people into two groups. Um, those who have uh, uh, information about what is happening and those who do not have such information, but they're just seeing the impact. They're just seeing what is happening to the economy. Now, for those who are informed, uh, we would say that those uh, category, that category of people uh, already know that uh, this is going to happen, uh, that there is going to be recession, and so it has not come to them uh, as a surprise, uh, as a surprise, because if you watch the macroeconomic uh, uh, indicators uh, in the past uh, couple of months and with the, uh, with the global pandemic, the total lockdown and uh, uh, the, 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 the shutdown of the global uh, supply chain, and of course, the, uh, the answers, it was just a matter of time mm. that we're going to get into a recession. Even uh, many uh, informed uh, Nigerians mm -hmm. had even predicted that the fall in aggregate demand, that is the decline in GDP growth, uh, was going to be in the, in the region of about 6% negative growth. And now we have uh, minus 3.6%, uh, uh, which some are even celebrating. That, that was even wonderful. So for this category of people, uh, they, uh, they are aware that there was going to be a recession, so it has not come to them as a surprise. Now, the other category that is not informed, and they begin to see the various uh, challenges and discontinuities in the system and total collapse of, of the system, they are beginning to see the impact in terms of their disposable income, in terms of uh, the, their social uh, you know, status, they are still, they are, the, the, level, the, the, the level of, uh, of, uh, of, uh, of savings, the level of investments, uh, closure of uh, companies, and so on. So it has been a disaster for this category of people. And um, so we will say that we, we take it from that level to say that it has been very, very disastrous for so many people. Many businesses have closed down, and many are not happy with government. Mm. You know, some of them, another category of people are those that ask or wonder how we can have two recessions in just a space of four or five years. And they wonder, is it just happenstance, just circumstances, or there's something we're not getting right in terms of economic management of the country? Perfect. Perfect. There's a lot we're not getting right in terms of economic management. Uh, remember, uh, during the time of uh, was, uh, during the time of Obasanjo, during the time of uh, of uh, Jonathan, you find that the economic, those who were, were managing the economy were not necessarily politicians. Uh, they didn't belong to any political party. We have one country, and that is Nigeria. Once you have won an, an election, we have a country to run, okay? And so they brought in uh, uh, Dr. Okunjo Wella, they brought in uh, Professor Sholudo, they assembled all the best, the eggheads in the system. We even had uh, you know, a coordinating minister for the economy. Because what the kind of system you are running now is disaggregated. It's, it's a lot of you know, uh, knee jack everywhere. Because there's no coordination. You have monetary policy in one direction. You have fiscal policy in another direction. You have income policy. So 
Yes, we have documents, sustainability, economic plan, and so on. But the point is, there is no coordination. And that is why the economy is in shambles. That's why we are where we are. So I agree with you that economic management has been in shambles. Has been in shambles. That is why we we'll keep on getting this recession. It has nothing to do with some are, are making the argument, oh, because of, uh, because of uh, pandemic. Uh, the next thing, because of answers. Because, 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 because. Many countries also uh, have this uh, problem. So economic management has been a major issue. And we need to sort that out. Okay. Well, Mr. Carey, do you, do you agree with him on the fact that uh, management of economy, the way we have managed the economy, is contributory significantly to how come we're in a recession despite the pandemic? Uh, it, 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 it is a possible cause. I mean, it's one of the factors that is uh, putting us into this situation. Now, remember, it is actually four years because the recession that we went into previously was in the middle of 2016. Now, it's, exact, it's just about four years and one quarter or thereabouts. Now, here is something for us to think about. One, before the decline in GDP growth in Q2, if you look at the previous 10 quarters, our GDP growth rate per quarter was at 1.5% to 2.55%, which means in the last two and a half years prior to going into this negative growth rate, we were growing at an abysmally anemic rate. Our population growth was around 2.6, 2.7% per year, which means that, you know, even though you are not, you, we were as a nation not in a technical recession, since the last recession, we have been growing at an abysmal GDP growth rate, which basically means that jobs were being lost, uh, all kinds of issues were going on, we were actually in a pandemic situation before the pandemic. That, that's how, so let's actually focus on that. The major factor had been oil price decline when you are an economy that depends on a single product for your livelihood. Now, the second, of course, is that with the, with the monetary policy shifts that were going on, some were experimental, some unorthodox. I have even mentioned in previous occasions that what the central bank governor was doing were quite unorthodox, and I don't believe it would work. Um, there, were, there was a very short moment when it really worked, but so far it has been completely, you know, knee-jerk, as um, uh, the gentleman previously mentioned. And, and so that now compounded the situation. So in addition to, so let's even put aside the COVID-19. So even prior to COVID-19, we were in a terrible situation. Two, the, uh, the exchange, there was a liquidity constraint as a result of the restrictions and of, of movement and so on and so forth that basically added to that negative 6.1% GDP growth in Q2 and then the subsequent one, uh, which is the last quarter, which was 3.6% uh, or thereabouts uh, negative. Now, those are not a pretty situation for any nation in the world, let alone a nation of nearly 200 million people. Um, and, and so we need to do something to boost growth. But that, I can leave it for some other time. Inflation from January to date had gone up from 12% to approximately 14.5%. Now, even if we were having positive GDP growth, with the job losses, and inflation rate, the average person will feel like it is a recession for them, but let alone when uh, the economists come out and tell us that we are in a technical recession. So essentially, the situation is not pretty for us, economy-wise economy speaking. Um, and then we may need to have to prescribe some, some measures. The, the boundary closure and all of those are all things that factor in. The only shining segment of the economy was ICT. Now, ICT doesn't require any government manipulations. ICT is what I would call a creative and innovative sector of the economy. And, and to a certain extent, even entertainment, because you don't need any special government 
uh, 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 intervention for it to work. Uh, all you need to do is people, investors, need to look at it as an opportunity that they can put their money in and they can get better returns. Now, the situation that we're faced with today as a nation requires some hard thinking and hard work from our government agents. Thank you. Let me, let me take this now to Mr. Kabweze. Now, a good number of issues have been raised, but uh, maybe we, you know, we'll bring them down to just three here. Uh, well, there is that talk that uh, we've had a knee-jerk reaction as far as uh, the economy is concerned. Everything just seems to be, we just seem to be responding to things on the go. Uh, perhaps uh, you want to respond to that. Added to that is the issue of inflation that's just been mentioned by Mr. Uh, Kerry, as well as uh, the fact that we haven't really been growing at the kind of speed that we ought to grow. We were you know, working, so to speak, on the brink of a recession even before the pandemic hit. How do you respond to these issues? Well, thank you. Um, I think that, um, I mean, on the surface, those would appear to be valid observations. But, I mean, let me begin with the question of... Um, whether the reaction has been knee-jerk. I think that, you know, that's not a fair characterization of uh, the effort that has been put in. Of course, not surprisingly, once ultimately it's results that people, if, if you deliver results without effort, you'll be held, despite how much effort, if the results don't show, it will look like there's none. But to, to, to say, to, to underscore the point that this is this not simply knee-jerk, let me read from the president's budget speech. When the president presented the 2021 budget speech, he said, and I quote, GDP growth is projected to be negative in the third quarter of this year. As such, our economy may lapse into the second recession in four years with significant adverse consequences. However, we are working assiduously to ensure a rapid recovery in 2021. Okay? So, um, you know, the economy lapsing into recession, it didn't take us by surprise. We had seen that and the measures taken. And the honest truth is that without those, uh, you know, countervailing measures, the you know the decline would have been steeper than you know than uh, you know what we you know we currently you know have okay so it's not correct to say it was just being um, you know it's just knee jerk uh, reactions to the situations to the situation the fact of the matter is that the global economy is currently in recession. There's hardly any economy in the world that is not currently in recession as a consequence of COVID-19. For us, unfortunately, you know, we were caught by this just at the point of recovery. We, were, we, we exited recession mid-2017 and entered a phase of recovery, which was, you know, subsequently to recover and then to grow. There were deliberate choices made by the current administration, which is its approach to driving growth. We have seen periods in this country where we had high growth, but the growth was not inclusive. And so side by side with high economic growth, poverty was also growing. This government is trying to work on a reset to have growth and inclusiveness together. Unfortunately, that has meant that the pace of growth is slower than, you know, if you were just, you know, single-mindedly focused on, on, on driving, you know, growth. That's, you know, basically, um, you know, the fact of the situation. There was the other point that you made, which just uh, escaped me now as I was addressing this. Can you also, remind me? Yeah, he's also talked about um, the abysmal growth, the fact that over the years the, the growth rate has been very, very low. We were down six that point something. That's what I said. Yeah. 
Yes, go on. That's what I just spoke to. I said we exited recession and entered a recovery phase. Okay. And so the growth was, you know, picking up. You will note that, you know, quarter on quarter, the growth was picking up. It was low. It was ad admittedly below uh, population growth. And for as long as that was the case, for the majority of the people, they may not have felt the growth. But I said it was, um, you know, a policy choice that the government of the day made to drive growth and inclusiveness at the same time, rather than a single-minded pursuit of growth, that you might achieve high growth without, you know, uh, inclusiveness, without carrying everyone along. No, I, I think the third one, which you were referring to, concerns inflation. The fact that, I mean, inflation is on the rise. I mean, we're reaching a point where we'll get to record rise of inflation in the country. So that's the third one, the third point which you wanted to respond to. So if you can do that briefly, so we can expand the conversation. Well, I mean, yes, inflation has been, inflation has been on the rise. Don't forget that, you know, inflation got as high as, you know, 18%. And then we had, you know, 12 successive, you know, uh, you know, lots of, of, of inflation declining and then you know it started picking picking up again and then when you look at the um, you know so we're still we're still significantly below the peak that we reached over the last you know four years but at over 14 percent inflation is worrisome and of course when you then have inflation side by side with you know negative GDP growth, that makes it even more, you know, more, uh, you know, worrisome. But when you look at this inflation, when you unpack it, you will see that the component of food, you know, inflation is, is you know, is really, that's the key, you know, the key driver of this inflation. And, and so, uh, essentially, our work is cut out uh, for us. We need to, you know, basically drive, you know, you know that drive, you know, growth, in that sector, fortunately, the agriculture sector, you know, re, you know, continues to grow, albeit at a currently lower. Even in Q3, it grew by about 1.4 percent, which is really low by the, the you know the the, the 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 standards of performance that we've seen from that sector. So we, we need to focus on that. We need to address all of the you know the the, the bottlenecks in the sector that. You know, make it difficult for um, you know produce to get to the market, you know, and and minimize you know the the the, the you know the harvest losses and and, and all of that. All right. I mean, some people have argued that, um, um, and that is true. It's a policy choice that government had to make right. closing we're, the borders. We're coming to we're coming to some of those to driving up food inflation because. Right. There was a lot of, you know, import of food coming to the... But it was a deliberate choice to, by government to do that and try and shore up, you know, uh, domestic production. And, and the, you know, oftentimes you have trade-offs when you make policy choices. And sometimes you need to trade off inflation for growth. Okay. Well, Mr. Cabo is a... We would like to expand this also. We'll come into some of the issues you've raised, especially looking at the ERGP, the ESP, the, the projections and what we have and what we're getting into, especially because the government says this is going to be quick exiting this recession. But let, let's come to our Lagos studio. Uh, Mr. Bolo, you, you've, you've seen some of the reactions, responses, let me use that, ex that term, from the government. Just yesterday we had the NPR decision. It was kept at 115 I mean, some will say that in a recession, maybe the, 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 the interest rates should go much lower such that you can have more money available for people to borrow. We understand that if, if, you, if it was left to people, people would increase the, the, the interest rates, but the government steps in. So they expected this should have dropped. So in terms of one, the NPR and other responses you have seen from government, how do you rate them in getting us out of this recession? Thank you very much. That's a very good question. Um, Ultimately, the efforts of uh, government, the efforts of anybody is summarized, you know, in the, what comes out in your macroeconomic indicators. We don't reward efforts. We are doing this, we are doing that. Everything is summarized in the GDP. The GDP 
is negative. Then you look at another indicator, inflation is going to 16%. So while you will say we are doing this, we are making efforts, we are making this, we are making that, you summarize everything. The GDP is a summary of everything. You talked about inclusive growth. That is even another layer. Let's not even go to issue of inclusive uh, growth. For me, it is quite abstract and uh, theoretical. Inclusive growth, inclusive growth. GDP is negative. Now, we have a unique situation. That is what he tried to paint. You have high par inflation. At the same time, you have negative GDP growth. So that the viewers understand what we are talking about. When you say negative GDP growth, that's a recession. What are we really talking about? Do we understand what that means? Negative GDP growth, and that is recession. It is simply, you know, a decline in your aggregate demand. Uh, this is pure economics. Decline in aggregate demand. And in a state of equilibrium, your aggregate demand is equals your aggregate supply, which is the same thing as your national income. And the same thing as output. That means output declined. That's what it is. So how do you now stimulate? How do you now increase the aggregate demand so that people will understand? Aggregate demand. An aggregate demand is a component of three elements. Your consumption, your investment, and then, of course, government spending. G, government spending. Now, if you bring in the external sector, we call it X minus M. That is export minus import. Okay? When you bring all of those elements together, you are talking about aggregate demand, which is now called GDP. That when this aggregate demand shifts to the, to the left, it means it is declining. That's what we are talking about. So how do you now increase demand? How do you increase output? It's output. So in a state of insecurity, for instance, you cannot go to your farm to produce. Factories are shutting down. You are the poverty capital of the world. Unemployment is very high. So there is no production. That is very simple. No production, and therefore your aggregate demand has shifted to the left. And if you are not in the liquidity trap, I will try to explain that if, they, if you are in the liquidity trap, that's a problem. But we are in the neoclassical region. You, you know, you're taking so, us to class on this. No, okay, what I'm trying to say is this. Okay. <laughs> so what I'm saying is that there is decline in aggregate demand. So what do you do? You expand. That is called expansionary government policy. That means the G must be expanded. The question then is, what are you expanding this on? Government spending. Is it on recurrent expenditure or you are expanding in productive? Don't forget, yes. Mr. Abolo, yes. that the same government says we really don't have that money. So what are we expanding to or from? But you're borrowing money. Where is the money that you are borrowing? You should, are, you saying, are you suggesting that government should still go and borrow when we have a 33 trillion naira debt on our necks, according to the Senate? I'm responding to your question. They say they don't have money. But they've been borrowing. They've been borrowing. Where's the money? Well, what you borrow, that money you are borrowing mm -hmm. ought to be invested in, that is productive investment, capital spending, not on recurrent. Mm. You know, part of the responses of this government has been the ESP. The economic sustainability plan which is meant to transition from the ERGP which largely the projection of the ERGP I mean the government failed to reach those projections let's just put it clearly so the ESP came 2.3 trillion naira and they detailed how it was going to, to, to be spent to stimulate the economy and the different projections so in terms of responses which is where I began the question referring to the NPR now the ESP looking at those responses, would you say they are enough to get us out of this recession as quick as possible? You see, the, 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 the issue is this. ESP, we, are, we do not lack plans in this country. We do not lack plans, ESP, uh, SSP, and so on. Those plans are, are based on certain assumptions. Assumption, that's what they are based on. They are not based on improbables, just like the answers just like the, uh, the, the global pandemic, they are based on simplistic assumptions. And therefore, when you have a discontinuity, 
when you have extreme events that occur, don't forget, it does not mean that because uh, you know global pandemic is going. Another one will come tomorrow. That is the world we live in. We are not talking about a yellow fever. The next you are going to see other. Maybe we are not praying for other answers, but there are always improbables. Therefore, when you are preparing a plan, it must not be based just on simplistic assumptions. You must base it on stressed factors. Hmm. Stress factors. Either you are going to use what is called historical scenarios or hypothetical scenarios. That's stress testing. So your plans, if they are not based on stress factors, within weeks or two weeks, that plan becomes nothing. That's hmm. what is happening. So you, are, you don't see a success of this plan or any relief coming from uh, these plans that government already has, especially the ESP? Let me make this point just before you do that. Yes. Let's take a break. <laughs> that's, that's a very important one, though, but let's take a break to uh, take a few messages and we'll be right back to this. Well, thanks for staying with us. So, Mr. Abolo, you want to answer that question? You, know, you don't think that uh, this, the ESP is significant even with 2.3 trillion naira, if even 2.3 trillion naira was released within 12 months as government planned? Yes, uh, let me first of all commend the government for coming up with a plan. At least uh, even a bad plan is better than no plan at all. Um, I have read that document. Uh, it contains a lot of uh, uh, good initiatives that can actually take us out of the woods. Uh, so I commend the government for that. But you know, in strategy crafting, in strategy generally, there's what we call the 80 20% rule, 80-20% rule. 20% goes to the planning itself, the plan. 80% is for execution. So you have a lot of nice things in the document. But based on my experience over time, we find that execution is always not up more than 10%. So the document itself cannot take us anywhere without you know, diligent execution of the plan. It's very simple. So if there is uh, a good monitoring mechanism and uh, you know, a framework to monitor the implementation of this, uh, of this plan, I think there is, uh, there is hope in the horizon. As you have read the document, you also recognize that each of the various indices, each of the various segments have uh, executing agencies and have um, you know, coordinating ministries, departments, and all agencies in them. And then I want to believe that the national, the economic uh, team that the government puts together under the vice president at the time for the for the recovery from COVID-19. ...to have laboratory established, and all they could get in 2020 budget was 20 million naira out of a billion naira, and they gave some other examples. So regarding the question about whether this budget, the, well, the appropriation bill, will get us out of a recession, what do you have to say about it? Well, first of all, let me say that, um, uh, you know, I received that invitation. It was, um, we had a prior scheduled engagement uh, to be with the uh, Minister of Transportation. We had a scheduled, uh, scheduled um, monitoring and evaluation uh, trip on, on the legacy bad on rail. And that's where I went to. And I thought that it was sufficient for uh, my director to address those issues. The budget office is not the DG budget, but the committee thought otherwise and uh, were rescheduling the meeting. And we will address those issues. But let me make the point that the budget office doesn't make uh, locations to specific projects. The budget office, you know, looks at the resources available and based on extant government priorities, breaks it up into what we call spending ceilings and allocates to you know, ministries, departments, and agencies. And those, the, the, the MDAs then choose the projects and programs that will you know, best achieve their sectoral goals. So if the point is being made about the, the adequacy of the entire budget, we have always been the first to admit that the, the, you know, our size of our public expenditure is, is too low. Our budget is far smaller than it ought to be. We have about you know, the, the lowest public expenditure ratio on the continent. And that's also you know, positively correlated to our having the lowest 
you know, uh, you know, tax to GDP ratio on, on the continent as well. That, we now so. the revenues, government, you know, and so we've been running a deficit budget, but there's a limit to how much that you can borrow. So should we, should the budget be 13 trillion naira? Absolutely not. It should be, you know, possibly even as high as three times that. Can it be in our current circumstances? You know, not, not, you know, not really. All and right, so sir. within the limited resources, we've got to pick and choose where this thing. In the same Ministry of Science and Technology that I, okay. I wish the committee, for instance, have vetted its fine to the fact that we have far too many agencies there, uh, you know, well, uh, uh, you know and, and the budget is splintered into well, all of those. Mr. Kabo, there, there are so and, many... And therefore, they end up not having enough yeah. individually. So many issues that you have raised and, uh, you know, all of you gentlemen have raised on this program today while well, the conversation most certainly has begun and um, it definitely cannot end here. But we have to thank you so much for your time. Uh, Mr. Ben Akabo is a DG uh, Budget Office of the Federation. Uh, thank you so much for your time. Mr. Bukakiare is a former chairman NESG and he's also an economist as well as Dr. Emmanuel Abolo economic researcher, a risk management professional, and DG of the Economic Think Tank Center Limited. Thank you so much. Thank you very time. much. It's my pleasure. Well, there is more where that came from after this break. Stay with us.